This is Claudia Herrig, who found herself speaking to investigators about the death of her husband, Carl, after years of investigation. But how did Claudia find herself in this position? So my plan was never, not for one single minute, to kill anybody on my swear to God. What causes a wife to end up murdering her husband? And what was it about this case that would take investigators more than 10 years to make an arrest? These are the questions we will delve into as we dissect the disturbing case of Claudia Herring. I'm very angry. Yes. If you had said that, I would be dead, he would be alive. Well, what happened next? The guy that got very angry and I got up real fast and I shot. Before we begin, we would like to send our sincere condolences to the loved ones of Carl Herrig, who fell victim to the abominable acts described in this case. Carl Herring was born on Christmas Eve of 1963 in the quaint small town of Newton Falls, Ohio. He was the second of three boys and was known as an intelligent and caring child. He had two siblings and the Herrigs were known as a typical American family. After finishing high school, Carl enlisted in the military where he went on to become a successful pilot. During his years of service, Carl met and married his first wife, Rhonda. While the marriage was short-lived, the couple remained close even after their divorce. They had two children together. Carl was a loving and devoted father. After leaving the military, Carl began flying commercially for Southwest Airlines. But it didn't take long for Carl to miss his time in the military, so he joined the Air Force Reserves in order to get back the small touch of the feeling of a military life. During this time, he was involved in operations in the Persian Gulf and it didn't take long for him to rise to the rank of major during his time in the reserves. It was during a mission in Peru that Carl met Carla del Castillo, whom he described as the love of his life. Carla moved to Ohio to be with Carl, and while she wanted to get married and have children of her own, Carl wasn't ready for that level of commitment again. He didn't want more children, and the issue became a deal breaker. Just two years after moving to the U.S. to be with Carl, Carla returned home. But Carl was undeterred by his previous heartbreaks. He decided he was ready to love again, and the next time he was going to commit 100%. He joined a dating site, and soon he was matched with a woman named Claudia Sobral. Claudia was a successful accountant in Queens, New York when she first met Carl. She was 40 years old, and she too had experienced her fair share of relationship grief. Claudia was born in Brazil during the tumultuous time in that nation's history. Her childhood was marred by poverty and financial struggles, so in 1989, she moved to the United States, hoping for a new life and better opportunities. She attended college and graduated with a degree before she met and married a successful doctor. But their marriage was also short-lived and just one year after gaining her American citizenship, the couple divorced. Just six weeks after Carl and Claudia first met in real life, Carl proposed. He told Claudia she was such a catch that he was worried that another suitor would approach her and propose, so he wanted to get in before anyone else had the opportunity. Claudia was delighted by the proposal because she too thought Carl to be a catch, and in the past few months she had fallen for him as well. Carl and Claudia got married at a small Las Vegas wedding, and Claudia moved in with Carl to the house that he had recently purchased near his parents' home in Newton Falls, Ohio. But the transition from New York to small-town living was a difficult one for Claudia, and it didn't take long before the couple began to argue and fight more frequently. Their arguments, often coupled with the consumption of alcohol, began to turn violent at times, with both parties engaging in hitting, slapping, and throwing objects when they would fight. It would be less than two years after Claudia and Carl first met that Carl failed to show up for work as expected on March 12, 2007. When Carl didn't show up, his superior officers knew something was wrong. It was unusual for the highly regarded Air Force Major to miss work and to not even communicate his absence. 
With no answer on his phone, his officers contacted 911 and requested a welfare check. Police arrived at the same time as Carl's father, Ed, who was able to let them in the home. To their horror, they found Carl's body crumpled at the bottom of a stairwell. But this had been no ordinary fall down the stairs. Instead, police found Carl's body had been covered in a duvet and a tarp. When they peeled back the covering, they could see that Carl had been shot three times, and it was clear that Carl had been deceased and left there for some time. Police immediately turned their attention to Carl's wife, Claudia, who was the only other occupant of the home. But there was a problem. Claudia was gone. Nowhere to be found, not in her hometown, not in the state, and not even in the country. This is what would lead to a decade-long effort to piece together the events of that terrible day, and even longer to bring Carl's killer to justice. Autopsy results confirmed that Carl had been shot three times, once in the head and twice in the back. The shooter would have to have been positioned at the top of the staircase. Two additional bullets were found embedded in the home's floor, as if the shooter had missed a couple of times while shooting at Carl. Forensic investigators at the time determined the killer must have known Carl as there were no signs of forced entry and nothing was missing from the home besides Claudia. Even the murder weapon was found inside the house. Carl's car was still parked in the driveway. Inside it was a suitcase thrown into the back seat like he was leaving to go somewhere quickly. But it wasn't just what they found inside the home that pointed investigators toward Claudia's involvement in her husband's death. Just four days before Carl's body was found, Claudia had closed her bank account and transferred $9,900 to a Brazilian account. The next day, she purchased a gun that had a laser sight grip installed. She also had visited a local firing range to practice using the weapon. Her car was missing from the home, and a BOLO alert was able to locate the vehicle parked at the Pittsburgh International Airport. When investigators looked at the passenger manifests for flights leaving in the three previous days, they found Claudia had flown to Sao Paulo, Brazil. Investigators were on Claudia's trail, but they still didn't understand what would have led Claudia to take the life of her caring and devoted husband. As they spoke to friends and family of Carl, a picture of their deeply troubled marriage began to emerge. Despite being married for less than two years, the couple had fought frequently. Carl described Claudia as lazy and unwilling to help around the house, while Claudia accused Carl of being emotionally abusive. Months before the death, Carl had mentioned getting a divorce, causing Claudia to faint. The next day, she had attempted to commit suicide by taking a bottle full of pills before driving away in her car, causing an accident. Friends warned Carl of Claudia's increasingly erratic behavior, and eventually, Carl came to realize for himself that the marriage was unsavable. But Claudia couldn't stand the idea of being left alone by Carl, and she began confiding in her friends telling them how she felt and what she would do if Carl was to ever leave her. I was eating and then Claudia just leaned over and said, if he ever left me, I'd kill him. Carl told his ex-wife Rhonda that it was over between him and Claudia and he was planning to move out of their shared house. In fact, he had rented a house which he was due to move into in just three days before his body was discovered. With Claudia's means and motive clear, she was a prime suspect in her husband's murder. And now it was just a matter of finding her in Brazil and bringing her back to America to face justice. Less than a month after Carl's murder, a warrant was issued for Claudia's arrest. But the request for Claudia's extradition hit an immediate roadblock. The Brazilian constitution explicitly forbids the extradition of its citizens. And because Claudia had been born in Brazil, she did have Brazilian citizenship, so authorities refused to comply with the request. Authorities from both nations were involved in a years-long battle, with one side determined to bring Claudia to justice and the other determined to protect one of their own natural citizens. In the meantime, Claudia had settled into a new life in Brazil. She started her own business, bought a home, and remarried. It appeared that Claudia had committed the perfect murder and had gotten away with it, 
going on to live a normal life. But Carl's family were not prepared to rest until they had received justice for their loving father, son, and uncle. They began a lengthy campaign which would go on to last more than a decade. Using the power of social media, news stations, and political input, they brought attention to Carl's murder in their attempts to get the Brazilian and United States authorities to agree on Claudia's extradition. The story was repeated across local and international news stations. Surprise, and yet then gratified because this is a long time coming. Back in November, Erin Moriarty and her team at 48 Hours published a piece about Carl Herrig's murder more than a decade ago. The lead suspect, Herrig's wife, Claudia, who fled to Brazil. This is the first time that a, a Brazilian-born citizen has ever been extradited. That's a big deal. Erin and her team spent two years researching the case. Along with Carl's brother Paul, Moriarty even made the trip down to Brazil looking for answers. Like why wasn't Brazil sending Herrig back to the U.S.? But that led to bigger questions. One of the reasons why her extradition was held up is at first question, would she get the death penalty? Um, they would not have extradited her if this was a death penalty case. During her time in South America, Moriarty discovered just what Claudia Herrig had been doing the last 11 years. Running her own um, accounting business, I saw it. She got remarried, she had a home, she had gone on like nothing had ever happened. But eventually, Claudia Herrig was arrested after Brazil revoked her citizenship. She had given it up when she became a U.S. citizen. She spent the last year and a half in prison. But she may have had plans to take action that would have kept her behind bars in Brazil. Because there was a rumor going through the prison that Claudia Herrig was so determined not to be extradited that she might hurt another inmate, do anything, uh, so that she would stay in Brazil. Despite their best efforts and the increasing awareness of Carl's case, it would take until 2016 for Brazil to revoke Claudia's citizenship. On January 17, 2018, Claudia was extradited back to the United States to face charges of aggravated murder. But the fight for justice for Carl was far from over. To the surprise of investigators, Claudia didn't deny killing Carl. Instead, she told investigators her version of the events in graphic detail right from the moment they met. From the outset, Claudia stated that she knows she will be convicted, but there are circumstances that investigators must understand. She told a story of violence, forced abortion, and ultimately a spur-of-the-moment killing in order to save her own life. But far from a woman traumatized by what she had experienced, Claudia appears excited and enthusiastic to talk to investigators. She declined to have a lawyer present, and over the next four hours, Claudia gave her account of the events leading up to Carl's murder. I, know, I, I thought backwards, it's going to start backwards. I, it's not fair. I so think, uh, in, in fairness, I think what you had already talked to Tony and I about on the plane, I think that that would be a very good place to start. It's all over the place, so yeah, I don't know if I would be able to repeat that. Okay. Well, here's what will happen. You can jump all over the place, you're allowed to do that. And then what we'll do is we'll try to bring you back in. We'll try to bring him back in and try to make sense of it. Bill. Yes. I know how hard. I want to be fair to the family, but I don't want to be unfair to myself. If I say only a few things and I don't say the whole thing. Right. I'm going to look very bad. We, we dated for two months. Two months. Uh, oh, my God. Uh, over the, the, the internet. He found me. I said, no, you are He was here. He found me. And he put a lot of pressure on me to date him. I said, but why would I want to date a woman in New York? You know, I said, no problem. Because I can, uh, I'm a pilot and I, I, I can work anywhere in the U.S. that I want. And there is a base that is about one hour from New York. And I, I, I can ask them to transfer me to the airport. I can transfer, uh, can ask to be transferred to there. And I, I, 
said, well, um, I don't know exactly what I said, but he said, I can prove to you that I can be, just tell me uh, what day you want to be, to be there, and I'll be there. This, I think I, I told him today or tomorrow, the next day, and he was there. So we met him that day. I met him that day. And I was like, wow, oh, it's me, it's not mine. <laughs> Pretty impressive. Right? Yeah, I was impressed. Yeah, I was impressed. And he was a very really good looking guy. He showed up so well dressed up and some hot pants and some look like leather material. But he was very well dressed. And I said, this man is very interesting. He's good cool looking. Why would he want it so bad? have to 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 uh, the long story but, well he 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 trapped him he wanted to marry me at any cost and right there that day that day wow didn't you say you were dating for like two months we dated for two months okay yeah but, but talk about getting married the first day the first day wow. Wow. yeah she goes on to describe their relationship as being violent from the beginning she claimed she had no money or access to their accounts, leaving her without money sometimes for weeks at a time. He used to make, he told me, that he used to make 120000 with the Air Force. I don't know if it's true. I never saw his checkbook. I never saw his bank account. I never had a joint account with this man. I never saw one dollar of this man's money. Never. Never gave me any of his money. Nothing, nothing. I paid all the bills in the house. No, I didn't. He paid the electric and the mortgage. Everything else was with me. For food, uh, clothing for, for, for him. I bought his clothes. My clothes, his clothes, uh, his son's clothes. Everything yeah. going out for dinner, everything else was with me. He paid for those two things. So, I remember he told me that with the Air Force he was going to make, uh, the Air Force he was going to make 25000 in Southwest, about 40, I think altogether was not more than 65000 He was abusive, but at the same time, uh, he, he would ask me for forgiveness, I always threatened to go back to New York, and he said he would change, he loved me. All I had to do was obey. If I obeyed, I would be happy. So he he was telling me that he knew what was best for me. Just obey. Don't talk. Don't have an opinion. I had a rule, a, a, a list of rules of over almost 30 things that I couldn't do. I couldn't choose my food. I couldn't choose my clothes, I couldn't choose my shoes, I couldn't talk, I couldn't pick my what I was going to watch on TV, I was going to pick, couldn't pick my, my, my anything in the house, the house was his, I couldn't pick a furniture, I couldn't pick a, 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 the color of, of the wall, nothing. I had to be invisible and silent. So... After a while, that part we're not doing. I couldn't. For this little time that you're talking to me, you know that I talk a lot. <laughs> yeah, we've talked a lot today. Yeah. We spent a lot of time together today. Yes, exactly. I, I couldn't. I have an opinion on things. Did that stuff really kind of lead up to the depression? That yes. They yes. Because I'm a woman that I can talk about medicine, I can talk about politics, I can talk about psychology, I can, okay. I can talk to you about. Uh, um, uh, the, the end of the world, whatever we want to talk about, I will talk to you about. It. Um, I have a lot of interest. So I, I, I have a lot of things inside my head. I read a lot. I, I, if I watch TV, I'll, I'll watch the news. I, I consider myself a nerd. I, I, I never drank. I never had drugs. Um, I don't have tattoos. I never went out with girlfriends. I'm from work to home. You're very intelligent. Oh, very smart. Yeah, we thought we yeah, we talked about that a lot in the flight. Yes. Very oh, thank you very much. But he didn't appreciate that. Oh, I do. Well, that was a a, a, a problem. That was my a, a defect. That was even though my the problem. Probably went through the depression. Yes. 
Yes, the the abuse. The, 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 in the tapes on, on, on the computer, you see how he, he, he called me a bitch, a, um, a, um, very bad words. The women, super women, a son of a bitch, words that I don't speak. No, the, these words are not part of my vocabulary. She also claimed that Carl was a sexual deviant who used her like a toy in his fantasies. He won a crazy lifestyle of doing all kinds of perverted stuff, men, women, everything, everything. And um, for you to have an idea of what lifestyle he liked, he was addicted to a, a TV show called Miles High. It's about uh, pilot school where everybody had sex with everybody. He won that lifestyle. And he had like that lifestyle. He was an unfaithful man. And he had sex with men and women. And, uh, and next to the bed, police was there. Police could see the bed was here. with things that he tortured me with, ropes, um, the whip, uh, the vibrator, uh, had all those gadgets. According to Claudia, in the October after they were married, Claudia found out she was pregnant. When she told Carl, he flew into a violent rage as he hadn't wanted to have more kids. As she spoke to investigators, Claudia went into graphic detail about the horrific circumstances which led to her being forced to have an abortion. Medical records from the time confirm that the procedure took place. I never want to be a father. I never want to have children. Because you're going to ruin your body. I love your body the way it is. You're going to get stretch marks. Like his first wife got a lot of stretch marks. And I don't want that. You're not going to do this to me. I want a wife. I don't want a mother. I don't want children. I want a wife. And I said, but I'm 40 years old. I, I can't. I, I'm not going to get an abortion. You will get an abortion. So I went to uh, see him in Texas. I mean, made a, a trip there. He didn't let me talk about this, this right, the, uh, the probation uh, technique on me. So he, he then before that, over the phone, he would call me all neurotic, crazy. You gotta get, get an abortion, you gotta get an abortion, you gotta get an abortion. So he would talk to me all the time about that. So, uh, and like I was going crazy. And we, when he came home to spend a weekend or a few days, I don't remember, a week, got a week off for a few days, he, he wouldn't let me sleep. And I begged him, I, I can't, I, 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 you, you're killing me, so you would keep me up. And he would stay on bed, sitting on bed. And I would lay down and fall asleep, he would wake me up. Wake up, wake up. So he would do that all the time. And I got sick. After a few days, my body just couldn't take it anymore. I got sick from the mental pressure and from uh, the, the mental torture from sleep deprivation. Uh, I wind up in the middle of the night. Uh, I felt pain and I said, I don't know what this pain is. And all of a sudden I had blood all over. And then he took me to, to a hospital. And I did the ultrasound. And they saw, uh, you are losing the baby. I'm trying to save it, but we don't know if we need to save the baby. But uh, um, just she did the ultrasound. So I don't see the fetus anymore. It, this, the sack is empty. Um, go home and rest. Does not. Uh, but then when I got home, I was the fetus inside the, the toilet, and uh, I, I heard that big much. <coughs> 
So I saw the blood and I stuck my hand because it was, I was very emotional to see this and put inside a, a, a little glass jar and I showed him he didn't want to see it and, and I put it in the freezer. I'll put it in the freezer because I want to bury it. <laughs> I want to bury the fuse and um, Despite the cruel treatment at the hands of her husband, Claudia decided not to leave their marriage. A short time later, she fell pregnant again, and when she told Carl, he had the same reaction. But this time, Claudia lost the baby naturally. But the loss of this pregnancy sent Claudia spiraling into depression, and by the time she found out she was pregnant for a third time in the following year, she had attempted to take her own life again. She decided that if Carl demanded she have another abortion, she would take her own life. That week, I, I knew I was pregnant, took the pregnancy test. Maybe it was a few days before that. Um, so I knew I was pregnant, but I didn't tell him. He was, he was on his trips. Um, Claudia claimed that that was why she had purchased the gun which was later used to kill Carl. She was so intent on ending her own life that Claudia had not only purchased the firearm, but she had visited websites detailing ways to end one's life and had settled on using a gun. But she realized that the recoil from the gun might cause her to miss her brain and she might survive. So, to prevent this, Claudia went to a gun range to practice handling the recoil of the handgun. She had also installed a laser sight on the gun to help her aim and control the recoil while at the range. Claudia became more animated as she discussed her plan to take her own life. She went into extremely specific detail, even demonstrating the position she planned to take and drawing diagrams for the officers. And, um, so I figured I had to do something very shocking for him to, to, to shake him up about this pregnancy. So I thought, oh, I know, I know. Um, I'll wait for him. He opens the door, I put that in here. So that's what I did. So when he opened the door and seen me with the gun, he saw me with the gun to my head, he would have no, no reaction. He would stand, keep staring at me, staring at me, and all of a sudden he doesn't move and he grabs the gun, grabs my hand, and keeps holding me, and then he just throws me against the wall. Interrogators encouraged Claudia to tell them exactly what happened the day of Carl's death and she agreed. She recalled that she told Carl she was going to kill herself as he walked in on her with the gun to her head. But when Carl heard this, he flew into a rage and began throwing her against the wall. Eventually, Carl told her that she should kill herself, but she should go into the basement to do it so she didn't splash blood on his paintings and on the walls. It was this statement that Claudia claimed tipped her over the edge from suicide to murder. If you had said that, I would be dead, he would be alive. Well, what happened next? The guy that got very angry and I got up real fast and I shot. Shot what? I shot the, 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 that him and that I was lying down. He was going. Come back over here, please. please. Yeah, I was like, go. I, I was lying down, right? I got up real fast. And I shot at him. It was so, he wasn't too far away. It was close. Was he down the steps? Where was he? He was going down the steps. Maybe he was on, on the, the third step. If it was here. Claudia walked investigators through her thoughts and actions immediately after the murder. She states that she called her family in Brazil and told them what she had done. 
and together they made a plan. Claudia needed to escape the country. She was discussing the cold-blooded murder of her husband and yet was smiling and upbeat throughout the interview. It was not until she recounted seeing her father in Brazil that she became tearful. This display of emotion goes on for some time, and eventually the interview is paused until Claudia could regain her composure. When the interview continued, one of the officers asked Claudia about a second gun she had purchased using her credit card. Despite previously being able to recall very specific details in the days and weeks before Carl's murder, Claudia claimed she could not recall having a second weapon, thinking maybe it must have been because she thought the second gun was better after trying it. To be honest with you, I don't remember why I, I wanted to buy the second gun if I thought that one would be more efficient than the other. Or maybe because I shot with, with a gun similar to that gun and I thought it was better. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I think I, I tried that gun, and I thought it was a good gun. It was like, yeah. How'd you try it? I think he let me fire uh, with a, a similar gun. So somebody at the range lets you shoot once, then you wanted to, you liked it, so you were going to buy one. The feel. They moved the questioning along and used a classic interrogation technique of circling back to the events surrounding the murder. It is here that Claudia's story and demeanor again became inconsistent with her previous assertions. She gets animated again, and gaps begin to emerge in her story. He bounced up off the ground. Yeah. After he shoved you down, what, what is he, what's his action after that? Does he start going down the steps? No, no, the first bullet knocked him. What's that? The first bullet knocked him. Not him? Knocked, knocked, knocked killed him. him. The first one. The first one killed him? The first one. He fell down. He was going down the stairs. Like this. Like, in his one foot, I remember his one foot did like this. He fell down. But there was not that, that sound like, Ugh! I don't know the sound. He, he died instantly. Let me ask you this. The first, now, you had a laser on that gun. No, but it was so, I didn't need to use because it was too fast. The, the, the laser was not for, I didn't buy a gun to kill anybody. I'm not saying you did. So the laser beam was, was there was no more use for it. It was just in the gun. Now listen to what I'm saying. Do you know where that first shot hit him? No, I, I, I actually, uh, I was just shooting. That's why I'm asking you, because the laser, obviously, if you have a laser pointing somewhere, it's hard to see where a bullet actually hits something, but it's pretty easy to see where that red laser is pointing. No, it was too fast. It's impossible to, 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 to... How close was he to you when you fired that first shot? From here to there, or less. From here to so, there. So, I would say at most this is six, six and a half feet, yeah. maybe? Yeah. So, very close. Very close. Okay. Claudia previously claimed that she had called her family immediately after killing Carl, but now she states that she ran out of the house and straight to the airport to escape to Brazil. I went straight from the main to the airport. I didn't go back into the house uh, because I, I, I want to have time to, to, to fly. So I put uh, a cover over him and a letter uh, uh, in case somebody came to the window, they would not see his body. So I would have time to, to get him out of the Claudia went back over her claims that she wanted to kill herself, not Carl, and that even after his death, she tried to end her own life again when she arrived in Brazil. In a particularly bizarre part of the interview, investigators asked Claudia why she had to kill Carl instead of simply getting a divorce. And to answer, Claudia got down on her hands and knees to demonstrate Carl's reaction when she had told him she wanted a divorce. Instead of killing him, it would have been easier to get a divorce. I tried, he wouldn't let me. How far did you go? I mean, would you, did you tell him, you told him you wanted a divorce? <laughs> Almost every day. Mm -hmm. 
what was his story? What was his answer? I love you. I beg you, I'll change. I love you. I love you. I can live with you, most beautiful woman in the world. I love you. I swear I'm going to change. Why wife won't, won't accept uh, uh, a man asking for forgiveness? Does that work? <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, I hadn't tried long enough, only two years. Well, then it's not like I had tried the 10 years. Oh, I already put up with you 10 years. It's not going to work. I have been only two years. So, you know, I have to try a little bit more. Concluding her interview with investigators, Claudia repeated the claims that Carl was a violent abuser, a sexual deviant, and that his murder was the inevitable consequence of his own so-called weird behavior. By the end of the hours-long interview, Claudia appears unremorseful, completely flat and emotionless as she sips water from a bottle and waits for further instruction. Claudia took the stand in her own defense and repeated her story of how the couple had met, and she became emotional when recalling how she had been pleasantly surprised when Carl had arranged an engagement party without her knowledge. And um, when you spent the weekend in New York, uh, who paid for everything? Uh, we shared, really. Okay. Um, and after he came and visited New York, um, you continued talking on email and the phone? Yes, we, from that point on, actually, he proposed to me that same night. Uh, and then we basically, we, we, we agreed to get married that same, same very night. You left Newton Falls, and did you meet up with anybody? Well, he took his car and he drove to his brother's house, Paul Herrick. I don't remember exactly where he lived, maybe Poland. And he left his car there, and his brother, Paul, Paul Herrick, drove us to the ferry. Okay. And were there any sort of discussions that you found unusual in the car? Yeah. They were discussing about a wedding, a reception, a wedding. A wedding that was going to take place with the reception. They were discussing where the this reception was going to be, uh, the location. Uh, I wasn't familiar with the names, but they were name, saying names of hall. I wasn't paying much, much attention because everything was so foreign to me. I didn't understand the names of the places. So I was kind of in my own world, you know, they were talking. I didn't know that actually they were talking about my wedding party, and I didn't okay. know I was going to get married. Okay. And when you got to Putin Bay, um, all Paul's friends were there? No, Paul. Oh, all Carl's. Carl's. I'm sorry. All Paul's friends were there when you got to? Yes, Chris Wiegen, Gary Dodge, and um, then the guy that was okay. here um, okay. as a witness. I don't remember his last name. And, and the wives, too, and all girlfriends. Okay. Um, Actually, at that point, there was nobody married at that point, but they all were engaged to get married. Okay. And did you find out that there was a special sort of party going on at Putin Bay? Well, I didn't know that there was a party, but it was. Uh, uh, everybody came to me to say, uh, congratulations, congratulations. And I was embarrassed. I thought I was missing something on the English language. I said, "What is that that I'm I am missing?" Because I don't know what they are congratulating me for. And I was just thank you, thank you, trying to giving it enough time for me to pick up and understand what they were congratulating me for. And they were congratulating me for my engagement. That was my engagement party that I had no idea. It, did, I didn't know anything about it. Okay. Uh, did, he, did he give you a ring at that time? No. As she had previously told investigators in the interrogation, the relationship deteriorated quickly, 
and Claudia was left having to pay for everything despite being unemployed after leaving New York to live with Carl. It wasn't long after their marriage that cracks began to show, and Claudia described a relationship where finances, clothes, and activities were strictly controlled by Carl. Under cross-examination, Claudia repeated her claims of violence and abuse at the hands of her husband. She painted a picture of a horrendous home life, which left her with no choice but to take her own life or Carl's. But this time, her recall of the events leading up to Carl's murder was not quite as animated or cheerful. This time, Claudia came across as a woman under attack who was determined to show that she was left with no choice but to take Carl's life. On the stand, she claimed that she had taken recordings of the way Carl had treated her, including violent rages, but the defense lawyers had convinced the court not to allow them in as evidence. Because of actions you took on March 12, 2007, you would agree that Carl Herrick cannot come in this courtroom and tell his version of events, correct? Neither can my three children that he killed. I'm asking you whether Carl Herrick... Please try and listen to the question. Can Carl Herrick come in and tell his side of the story? It's an easy question, yes or no? Yes, he can. He can? Yes. Where is he going to come from? If you tell the truth to this court, he can, because I have a recording of every day of my life for two years, and this court knows, and Dennis Watkins know, and you know that my whole life was recorded with voice recording, and it's not in here, it was not brought in as evidence. Why are you lying to this court, to this jury, and, and to Brazil, and to me, to my face? Right. Could you bring my computer here and play the whole tape for these people to hear the whole truth? The prosecutors grilled Claudia on her feelings towards Carl before his death. In her interview, Claudia had said that Carl's poor treatment and abuse had built up over time, and this had led her to snap and kill him. In contrast, under cross-examination, Claudia paints a picture of herself as holding no resentment or anger towards Carl repeatedly answering no when she was asked if she was angry with Carl for the way she had been treated. Before you sh shot Carl Herrick, you were upset that he had an engagement party for you at put bay correct? I thought that was very weird. That was a sign that something Yes or no? Wrong. I'm not asking for an explanation. All I want to know is yes or no. Before you shot him, you were upset that, you had an that he had an engagement party for you at put bay no, there is no connection with that. that I think you're confused. You were not upset with him about that? No. Okay. Before you shot him, you were upset that he, you married him after only 50 days of dating? No. No? I wasn't you mad about that. You weren't mad about that. Before you shot, and shot him, were you upset that he trapped you or tricked you into marrying him? No, I think blame for stuff. Yes or no? No. no. Before you shot him, were you upset that he didn't move to New York like he said he was going to? No. Before you shot him, were you upset that he had, that you had to leave that New York accounting firm? No. Before you shot him, were you upset that you had to move from New York to Newton Falls? <laughs> no. Before you shot him, were you upset that you had to pay for everything except for the mortgage and the electric bill? I was a little upset. I mean, but what was not before? Yes or no? I'm no. not asking yes or no. No. No, you were not no. no. Before you shot Carl Herod, were you upset um, that right after you got married, he'd went away for training for a few months? No. Before you shot him, were you upset that his son moved in with you? I don't know. I don't understand the question. I'm going to answer no to... What's your... I not understand the question. We're getting to the... Point. You were asking me... Can you answer was... the questions and not argue with me, please? I'm not understanding the question. Okay. Before you shot Carl Herrick, were you upset that, he, that you had these miscarriages with him? I don't think I understand the question. Okay, be before you shot him, were you upset that you had had these miscarriages? I'm not understanding your question. Okay, let's move when, on. Before when? Five minutes, minutes in one day? I'm not understanding the question. Okay. Were you mad before you shot Carl Herrick that you had had miscarriages? What do you mean by before? Five before minutes. you shot him. 
a year or have I been, ever been? I'm not understanding what you mean by before. Any time, any point in time, before you shot him on March 12, 2007, were you upset or mad at Carl Herod for the miscarriages? I'm a very forgiving person and I'll, I was upset at one time, but not the next minute. I don't bring problems from one day to the next. Before you shot Carl Herod, were you upset that he threw away that one fetus that you had and threw it away? I was upset at that day, yes, at the time. Okay. Before you shot him, were you upset that you, uh, he made you train and run in the woods while you were pregnant? I was upset at that day, yes. Okay. Before you shot him, were you upset that he looked at those pornographic websites? Well, that was his problem. Before you shot him, were you upset that he picked out the clothes you wore? I didn't realize at the time that yes or I was no. being... Uh, all I want to know is yes or no. These are simple questions. I didn't like that very much. And before you shot him, were you upset that he made you wear only open-toed high heels? I didn't like that. Okay. Before you shot him, were you upset he made you walk around the house naked in high heels at night? Yeah, I didn't like that. All right. Before you shot him, were you upset he had some weird sexual fetishes, according to you? Uh, yeah, I didn't like that. Okay. And you agree, at this point, that Carl Herrick cannot come in here and explain any of these situations that you testified to, correct? Yes, he can through the voice of the witness. No, no, he can't. He can get on this witness now. Is he testifying? Don't testify, Mr. Whitaker. Go ahead. Well, can Carl Herrick come in this courtroom and testify? No. Okay, thank you. Can Carl Herrick come in this courtroom and dispute or admit or deny anything you've said to this detective or to this court yesterday? Mm, no. The prosecutor asserted that she had made these claims of mistreatment and abuse purely to defend herself and justify her evil actions. Claudia claimed that she had purchased the firearm with the intent to end her own life, but not the life of anyone else. But on that gun that she had purchased, Claudia had installed a laser sight to help her aim the gun and practiced using it at a shooting range days before the murder. At the trial, the prosecution noted that you wouldn't need to install a laser sight if you were only intending to use it on yourself. Rather, this would be an attachment much more useful if she was intending on pointing it at someone else and committing murder. The prosecutor took Claudia through a dramatic cross-examination of her behavior in the days leading up to the murder and then the murder itself. Though Claudia repeated her version of the events that she told Carl she was pregnant for the third time, when he got angry, she threatened to end her own life, and it was his response that led to his murder. Her assertions of self-defense were not enough to sway the jury. We, the jury, in this case, duly impaneled and sworn our firm, find the defendant, Claudia C. Herrig, guilty of aggravated murder as she stands charged in the first count of the indictment, dated this date, signed by all 12 jurors. As to the specification, we, the jury, in this case, duly impaneled and sworn our firm, find the defendant, Claudia C. Herrig, did, at the time of committing aggravated murder, have a firearm on or about her person under her control, brandished the iron, a firearm indicated that she possessed it or used it to facilitate the offense. Again, dated this date and signed by all 12 jurors. Ms. Fowler, did I properly read the verdict of your jury? Anything further from the state? No, Your Honor. Anything further from the defendant? No, Your Honor. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, again, without your assistance, we can't resolve these very difficult cases. I thank you very much for your time. And as to this case, uh, you are will be dismissed. Uh, bond is revoked. She's remanded in the custody of Troma County Sheriff for sentencing tentatively scheduled for uh, February 8th at 10 o'clock. With that, we're adjourned. Twelve years after Carl's murder, Claudia was found guilty of aggravated murder. She was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after serving 28 years. This means she will be eligible for parole in 2044 at the age of 101. 
With the conclusion of the case, questions were still hanging. Were Claudia's actions justified by years of abuse and violence? Or did she commit cold-blooded murder out of a hatred for a husband who had intended to leave her? We'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions in the comments section. If you found this story compelling, don't forget to like the video, comment down below with your take on it, and please subscribe to the channel. Also, don't forget to hit that notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadows.